All right, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the Stack Strength Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Daniel DeBrock. And today we've got a special guest, Brian Mann. So, Brian, thanks so much for jumping on. Um, been a huge fan of your work for a very long time, and it's great to finally have you on the show. Can you give a little bit of a an introduction for maybe those who aren't familiar with you and some of your background? Yeah, uh, you know, my, my name's Brian Mann. Uh, I am uh, the director of sports science for Olympic sports, as well as a, an associate clinical professor here at the University of Miami. Uh, I started in strength and conditioning in, uh, well, I started lifting weights whenever I was uh, over 30 years ago now. Um, and, uh, you know, and I got into strength and conditioning at the college level in 1998. It was a different era. I was actually an undergraduate a student at the time coaching athletes who were older than I was. Uh, you know, I didn't have a problem with it, though, because I was stronger than all of them. I had already won, you know, some national championships in powerlifting for, for my age and weight. Uh, so, you know, I was real confident with my lifting abilities, and I'd already known what I wanted to do, and I'd already been studying strength and conditioning, collegiate strength and conditioning, for uh, six years at that uh, that time point. You know, I, I went to a strength and conditioning camp with uh, some people that, that most of your listeners probably would never have heard of, a guy named... Uh, Kirk Wolfolk, who uh, had been the director of strength and conditioning at Notre Dame, and I think he's still the director out of Navy, uh, actually, at the Naval Academy. Uh, not for football, but, I mean, like for, for everybody else. Uh, a guy named Rob Rogers, uh, who is now in the tactical sector uh, for strength and conditioning. And then uh, Russ Ball, who is uh, a front office guy for the Kansas City Chiefs now. You know, they sat down and they spent the time talking to me at age 13 like I was a, a grown man, and uh, let me turn off my email. I didn't even think about that dinging in here. I'm sorry if that, uh, if everybody could hear that. No, nope, you're good. Didn't hear anything. Come on, turn off, turn off, close. Why are you not closing? Uh, but I have no idea what that is. Um. Well, but like I was saying that these guys talked to me like I was a grown man and they had me read uh, Doc Kreese's book. So, you know, I had studied that and everything else I could get my hands on. And then it was just uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Uh, I happened to be sitting, I was sitting at a table skipping one class to study for another test. And um, one of my friends from high school who was on the football team walked up and then the head strength coach walked up after that. And Fitz was like, yeah, he's does powerlifting you just won the national championship and rick's like uh uh well i can't pay you anything but if you want a job uh you know you can come up and work for me and knowing exactly what i wanted to do i closed my organic chemistry book and i went up there uh, to start that afternoon in the weight room and uh, you know the rest they say is history from there i went uh, on to arizona state where i worked with under joe ken uh and then I went, uh, had a family emergency uh, pop up, and I had to go finish uh, at University of Tulsa under Pat Ivey. He went to Missouri uh, after that. I went back to Missouri State for a year under Rick Perry. Uh, and then uh, when Pat got the job at Mizzou, I was there for 15 years, and now I'm here at Miami. So that's, uh, I guess, my life story in about three minutes. That's awesome. And, like, what a huge opportunity as well to be able to actually be mentored by, by some of those guys. Oh yeah, um, I think it's 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 really cool actually. So, to me, a lot of that stuff has kind of come out in your writing because, uh, as I mentioned before we were um, before we started recording, I kind of binged on a ton of the articles you'd written uh, for Elite FTS, and there were so many that were kind of an article series talking about the champion's mindset, talking about teamwork, talking about mentorship, talking about mindset, and it was really interesting just to kind of even hear what you're saying now and how, and how that comes through. And so I guess a, a good place to start, uh, I think, would be, and I'm going to kind of quote one of your articles, actually. So you were talking about Custom Auto, who, massive Mike Tyson fan, massive Custom Auto fan. So I, right when I saw the title, I was like, I got to read this one just, just because of that. Um, so I'm going to read I'm gonna read an excerpt uh, where it says, the champion and coward stand under the same bright lights and feel the same butterflies in their stomach. The champion uses the butterflies as fuel to dominate their opponent. The coward succumbs to their weight and is consumed by anxiety. So, to me, that's a very impactful statement because, you know, I'm a competitor, you're a competitor, and I think any competitor can kind of relate to that on some level. So, you've been a coach for a very long time, and I was wondering how you go about guiding someone who does experience a lot of fear and anxiety, especially, let's say, early on in their career, or maybe even if they've been doing it for a while. 
but getting them to that point where they have that, you know, quote unquote, champions mentality, like you were talking about in the article. You know, uh, it's just letting them see, at least for me, getting them to experience it and not just because, let's see, I guess I need to uh, talk about this and explain this with another story. Uh, and this is one I got from Buddy Morris. There were two monks uh, were, who were walking around a pool, and the young monk asked the old monk, is the water cold? And the old monk throws him in. And the young monk gets out, and he is just absolutely livid. He said, I asked you if the water was cold. I didn't ask you to throw me in. And he goes, well, how am I to know what you think is cold? You know, when I drink tea, I drink tea. When you drink tea, you drink tea. When I drink tea, you don't drink tea. And when you drink tea, I don't drink tea. I do not know what you think is cold, and you do not think what I, uh, you do not know what, you get what I'm saying right there. I, my caffeine apparently is running out for the length of that story. Uh, but uh, just basically getting people into those situations and talking about them afterwards. It doesn't, you're going to have anxiety. These things are going to be happening anyway. It's get out there, do it, and then let's talk about it afterwards. And let's find, you know, and I think that the mentorship part is, is crucial to make sure that the mentor doesn't try to demean and demote, but use, uh, you know, try and build the person up and, and come at it from that aspect. Uh, I've had both types of mentors, uh, and I... If it weren't for the build-up people, I probably wouldn't be here. I probably would have uh, would have gotten out of it a long time ago. But um, you know, just looking for that. So, and then how do we do that? Okay, great. So then it would be find what the person did right, build upon that. Okay, hey, you know what? You got out there in front and you had your whistle. Fantastic. Now let's do it a different way for this point. Let's do it a different way for that point. Uh, so getting them to understand that these uh, these challenges. Uh, aren't as great as what you think they might be that a challenge is just a challenge and we need to be able to uh, go and do that and sometimes what the challenge of getting up in front of the group may be too much uh, for that individual and maybe they don't need to be doing this and that's okay but there's also other aspects because there's other things that we could do about that right we could go and we could try and um, uh, get them some public speaking experience. You know, there. Uh, I don't know if it's still a thing, but there used to be this thing called Toastmasters, mm -hmm. right? Where yeah. it was, you know, you get up in front of people, learn how to, you know, you should learn how to get up in front of people and talk and give a toast, and uh, you know that that gives people more confidence and, and things like that. That uh, you know, so that you're now you've been in front of the groups and you've done it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I say the same thing for people who are getting ready to go give a lecture for the first time, and I see that they're really nervous. I, but that's not saying that I don't get nervous too. Uh, there's people that uh, will tell you, it's like, dude, Brian Mann went to the bathroom 14 times before he gave his talk. Yes, yes, I did. You know, I absolutely did. And then I went up on stage and listened to, you know, uh, eight mile uh, final rap battle and Muhammad Ali. I'll show you how great I am to get up on stage, you know, spitting fire and being confident. It's uh, so there's a little you know uh, dirty secret of uh, Brian Mann. That's uh, that's how I get on stage, uh, but uh, you know it's just try and approach them and, and let them experience those things and be the mentor that's there to help them along uh, and give them tools and, and things that I've found in my past and I've heard about uh, for them to succeed rather than just throwing them out there on their own. You know I think that that's a, a key thing. Yeah, I think there's definitely a time and a place for the, you know, tough love mentality, but it definitely has to be bolstered by that relationship. I think if that foundation isn't there, you can't dip into that well when you need it. Like, yeah, I don't no, you can't tell somebody to F off. Yeah, no, yeah, no, that you're, you're just going to be driving people away. Um, mm. And that's not what we need. You know, uh, I mean, shoot, look at uh, look at England right now uh, with their what are they called? Cannonly ears or something like that. They've got 38,000 bells that need to be chimed for Charles's coronation, and they've only got 30,000 people who are trained to do it. You know, so what's that down there in a fall of 8,000 people? You know, you can't go around and dog cuss people and be mean to them all the time, especially in a profession where to have a living wage is a huge thing. You know, we're, we're always underpaid. 
So why do you want to demean somebody and give them one more reason why they wouldn't want to do this job, man? It, it, to me, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. you're, you're driving people out of the field rather than allowing people to gain. And, and some people will come back at me, well, maybe the field needs to shut down if people aren't having living wages. Well, maybe, maybe not. I, I, you know, that I'm not one to say. But I can say that quality of life is a, a huge thing and um, having a good working in non-hostile working environment is a good thing as well. Yeah, but there is a time so. and a place for everything, man. If somebody's messing up, you sometimes you just got to drop the hammer and let them know that you're messing up. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's kind of what I, was, uh, what I was saying, right? Like I think that you can do that if you've had, if you've already built up that relationship because yeah. you never do that. So the fact that you're doing that tells them, holy fuck, I messed up. I really need to do something, you know, and, and you use it very strategically. Like, um, it's funny how that kind of developmental process occurs, actually, because I was talking about this with one of my athletes not too long ago, who um, I've been coaching them for almost five years now, and uh, we've become very close friends, actually, and we were chatting about it, and when, uh, when they first started uh, working with me, they were hyper nervous, super self-critical, like did not have a lot of confidence, just kind of, you know, checked off all the boxes for not being a very good mental athlete. And, you know, it's just that graded approach, like you said, kind of building people up over time, finding the wins, getting them to recognize their wins is a huge one. And then constantly being like, hey, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And almost like brainwashing them. Right. <laughs> and, and then over time, they start to see it themselves. And when they see that vision, then it's like, boom, things just take off because now they have so much intrinsic purpose. And it's really cool to see that kind of transformation happen because it doesn't happen overnight. Like, I mean, it's literally taken years for this particular individual. Right. And I, I think that's kind of similar with with a lot of people. Like, I don't know. I don't know many people who just come right out of the gate incredibly confident, you know, <laughs> because then I almost think that that's just sort of feigned arrogance, you know. It's like oh yeah, it's unearned, right? Yeah, no, there. It, I wouldn't be here if there weren't other people who had confidence in me because I didn't have confidence in myself. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, you know, there. I, I can give two exact examples that I still go back to when days get tough. Uh, you know, there was a guy named Antoine Floyd who I worked with at Missouri. We were uh, we shared a, a, an office. Uh, whenever I was a graduate assistant, he was a full time assistant. He's working for the Houston Rockets now, and it, there was one point when he was like, you know. I don't have to know anything. You are going to be somebody who changes the game of strength and conditioning one of these days. And all I have to do is look over at you and ask you the question. I don't have to learn anything. And, you know, that he and I definitely had our disagreements over the years, but just his confidence in me uh, and my thoughts and the way that I went about things, that, that helped tremendously. And there was another guy named John Tifo who during my doctoral work, I, I ended up in a, you know, the, some of my people on my committee didn't get along super great. And, um, and I wasn't the greatest communicator at that point in time either. So things got sideways a few times during the process. And he's like, look, man, you know, you're going to be another time. Somebody was like, you're going to be somebody that changes the way that the NSCA works. You know, you could go be, you know, on the board or maybe even president of it one day. Just stick to the plan, keep going, keep your head down, keep doing the work. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you're, you could be that dude. And um, if it weren't for those two individuals, I'm, you know, sharing their confidence in me um, on bad days, then I, uh, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here. I, mm -hmm. I would be out. Yeah, hundred percent. Like it, it makes such a difference um, when, when you have those people in your corner. That's actually something I've become increasingly interested in is uh, the culture around, I guess the community around strength culture in general, because I've gone to places where they have, you know, a couple extremely high level guys, you know, but then I've gone to places where everyone's kind of, everyone's quite strong, but not like super elite yet. But then it's that collaborative, like they just have such a strong community that everyone just makes everyone so much better. And then in three years, all of a sudden, it's like you've got 30 guys and girls who are just absolute beasts. And it's it's really, really important to have those people around you to just kind of support you, to keep you going, to, you know, keep that competitive edge as well, call you out when you're being a bit of a bitch. And then, yeah. And then also support you, you know, like showing up to competitions to cheer you on and stuff like that. So it's 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 super, super important. Dude, that's why I love going to Westside and training there. You know, I started going there and, 
uh, 2002, and I think my last time there was 18 or 19, you know, before the pandemic, and uh, training there with those guys, and you know, seeing that that collaboration that you just mentioned. I mean, shoot, every set that I did coming off of there, uh, and I wasn't a resident, you know, I, I, I was driving in a few times a year. And, you know, that watching them coaching each other, watching and having them coaching me on every rep, every set, you know, even the guys that didn't like each other, they're still coaching each other up on it because they're wanting them to get better so that that's going to force, they want their uh, teammate to get better because then that's going to push them to get better. And, you know, just that collaboration and, uh, and also the, uh, the for lack of a better term, you know, the shit talking that went on in there, you know, I, uh, I can still remember there was one day whenever I knew that I had made it, it was the, uh, we were doing suspended bar good mornings, uh, the cambered bar, not the, uh, I mean, this is the old school cambered bar that's got like the tape around it and uh, it actually fit on the rack. Uh, you know, that Matt Smith and Greg Panor, you know, Luke Edwards was the only guy that beat me. And then for them to do all of the smack talk and for this, you know, the last set for Luke to go up and do to win. And they're like, you can't let an outsider beat you and all this other crap that, you know, they were just firing him up with that, you know, that intensity was there. Uh, so you've got to have that intensity. But if you have that intensity and that collaborative effort, man, it doesn't matter where your gym is at now. It's it's going to the top. Uh, and then all you have to do is stay on top of it and make sure that the collaboration stays positive. And, uh, and you guys are going to be breaking records at some point. Yeah, 100%. So um, I'm actually really glad you brought up Westside because there, there's quite a few things that I wanted to touch on that I've uh, seen you write on uh, a fair bit. And one of them was speed training, particularly mm -hmm. in, in strength sports. So this is something that I've seen a lot of people talk about from a lot of different angles. But in my opinion, it's sort of... I don't think many people have done a very good job at really expressing the relevance of speed training for strength sports in general, uh, both from like a kind of you know mechanistic perspective as well as more of a practical perspective. And so I was wondering if you could give some examples or instances where implementation would be beneficial, uh, particular strategies of implementation, and also where they might want to utilize that in their sort of competitive cycle, if it's in the off season more, if it's in season, or if you can do it year round, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, it all gets down to context, right? You know, for some people are going to be saying that uh, th there has been a debate for at least 15 years about, you know, like if dynamic effort is actually useful or not. And uh, both sides have valid points, but both sides don't have the full, complete picture. Now, the one side that says you don't need dynamic effort because... Uh, We've got, you know, this is a strength sport and it's 1RM and the only thing that matters is the low, you know, the low grind, uh, the low gear grind of being able to push that out and, uh, and have uh, your maximal motor recruitment and as much cross-sectional area as you can. Well, that's, that's true, but whenever you get really heavy, how are you going to refine your technique? You're not. You're going to always go back to the... Uh, least common denominator, you're going to go back to the, you know, water fly, flows through a, a river a certain way for a reason. You know, it, it doesn't go uphill. It doesn't go in, in directions that would be difficult to it. it. It finds the easiest route. Well, just like that, the your muscle forces are going to be going for the easiest route to uh, complete the job, right? So you're that's the way that you're going to be doing it. Now, dynamic effort allows you to go on a lighter load so that you could enhance that technique. Now, the other side of it. Power is something that's super important, and it seems like power doesn't matter what sport you're in, even if it's a 1RM sport like power lifting, which, honestly, that's not the best term for it, but if you go back uh, to the original reason of why it was named that way, it makes sense. It's not correct. But it makes it makes sense, you know, because of lack of terminology and things like that back in 1964. Uh, but whenever we get down to it, we know that from Kaneko's work in 1983, uh, he where they used actually a method that an exercise physiologist got the Nobel Prize for, which I still think is incredible to this day. I think you know I don't know if anybody's in exercise phys after A. B. Hill has won it, but we know that there's different ways that you adapt. To different styles of training. Uh, in Kaneko's paper, 
they looked at a unloaded, con you know, so everybody did bicep curls and they only trained one way for the entire study. So there would be a group of people who trained at an unloaded condition, a group of people who trained at a 30% of 1RM, a group of people who trained at 60% of 1RM, and a group of people who trained at 100% of 1RM. And they looked at how they produce force, how they do produce velocity, and how the product of power was then derived. And what they found was if you train at 100% of 1RM, you have a great improvement in force, a small improvement in velocity, and then that means a decent improvement, an all right improvement in power, but power also shifts to the right as far as time goes. So you might not be able to call upon that power in a, a sports specific activity if we're talking about team sports or individual sports that are outside of strength sports. Uh, at the, you know, because in the strength sports, it doesn't matter. Well, Olympic weightlifting, it would, but uh, in powerlifting, it, it wouldn't. Uh, then let's flip to the other end, right, is the unloaded. Okay, so training with no load and moving it as fast as you can. Huge improvement in velocity, no improvement in, in force. Anything times zero is zero, right? When it wasn't actually zero, it was really small. So we saw that power improved, but it was only a little bit, but it did go straight up and maybe even slightly to the left, meaning that you could call upon that power more uh, easily and call upon it sooner, you know, you hit that peak power sooner. Uh, then there were left the 30 and 60% loads. Well, <clears throat> the biggest improvements in power happened at 30%, and that's no surprise if you look at the research, right? The, where does peak power occur? Usually somewhere between 30 and 60% on uh, most lifts. Of course, the, uh, the joint matters, the fiber type matters, the pination matters, and all those things. So uh, really, if you look at uh, any textbook that's good, they'll actually have a super wide range of where peak power occurs, between 30 and 100%. Because the joint, you know, you, you can't uh, you have just one set because every joint and the integration of joints is going to matter. But back to the point that the 30%, there was a okay improvement in force. There was a large improvement in velocity. It had the biggest improvement in power, and it went straight up. 60% was the Goldilocks load, right, where you had equal improvements in force and velocity, and you had the second biggest improvement in power. And it, again, so it went nearly straight up. So I tell all of that because every person is going to have a weak link. They're going to have a weakness. And if you can just go in and dial in to where that weakness is in your own training, you can make the lift go, you know, if, it, if you're a power lifter, you can make your 1RM go up better. Now, it's like, how? If I'm training light and fast, well, you just said speed and force, you know, that, that, that interaction, whatever. Okay, let's think about it. And whenever I first started training Westside Barbell, and started doing the dynamic effort, all of a sudden, my lifts were going up fast. Like the actual concentric portion was going up faster. And then I could use that momentum of sort, or inertia really, I guess is probably the better uh, term for it, that I would blast through my sticking point. And then that caused my lifts to continue to increase. Now, I did have to continue to work on the special strengths for those sticking points. But that light, those light loads, that's where I sucked at. And then that was the low-hanging fruit that got better. Then my competition total got better. Now that's also going to have a ceiling. It's not going to say that just by getting, you know, doing the same 60% for eight sets of three or 12 sets of two or whatever it might happen to be that you're uh, you, that that's going to make everything better all the time. No, it's not. You're going to have to find different voids to fill. Uh, but. The, you know, just use the low-hanging fruit while it's there to, to see those improvements and those adaptations. And if you're not doing that, I think it's ludicrous because, again, it's, it, I call it low-hanging fruit for a reason. You can see these great improvements in performance from a, a small change to your training program. Mm -hmm. No, that definitely makes sense. And I think, yeah, I, I appreciate the clarity around that. And so um, one of the things, I guess, maybe I'd like you to expand on was because you talked about, or you kind of referenced upstream and downstream benefits, and you kind of talked about mm -hmm. it uh, being the left or the right. Can you sort of go into that a little bit more? Because I don't think some of the people who are listening might have the kind of context to, to understand that. Yeah, you're right. They haven't had all the rest of my classes. I'm up here explaining <laughs> it, referring to studies that I talk, to about, uh, talk about in class all the time. So uh, by the left and the right, I mean at, at the time at which peak power occurs. 
right? Or you could even look at it as the, the load at which peak power occurs. And then, uh, so if we look at it from a, a load power perspective as opposed to a time power perspective, uh, a load power would show that what does this person need to improve upon? If they do a, sorry about that, if they do, uh, if they're hitting peak power at like 70% and they're supposed to be 30 to 40%, it's like, well, we know that the low-hanging fruit here would be the velocity into the spectrum. So if we get them stronger, I'm sorry, if we get them, uh, give them a velocity emphasis, they're probably going to get a little bit stronger. Um, yeah, because, uh, uh, and then let, let's get back to it, we'll keep going before I jump around. Uh, conversely, if somebody was at like 10%, well, we would know that uh, they need to get stronger if they're hitting peak power at 10%. And that's without the inclusion of body mass, uh, because then that, that starts muddying up the waters. Who, what's the main uh, listenership that you've got here, Daniel? Uh, mostly, I'd say a good combination of like coaches, but mostly it's like strength and hypertrophy. Strength and hypertrophy, okay. So then we won't really need to worry so much on, uh, on, on that for the power. It's like, you know, for speed and, and everything else. Uh, but on the flip side of it too, um, Gosh, I forgot where I was going because my phone started ringing. I had to check and make sure it wasn't my wife, you know, kid emergency. Uh, clear. Okay, and then it was on the time. Uh, the time to peak power, what I'm really referring to there is that outside of powerlifting, uh, pow uh, power is a rate-limited activity, right? You've only got so much time to produce peak power. So if I make peak power go up, but it takes too long to get there, right? It takes too long to produce that power. It's not usable because it's not going to be called upon because my activity is already complete. What I mean by that is if it takes me uh, 0.6 seconds, I'm just throwing something out randomly. It's, let's say it takes 0.6 seconds for me to hit peak power, but I have 0.2 seconds to produce force for this activity. Well, that increase of power that I got is 0.4 seconds too late. Right, it's like the shot already went up. It went into the goal, and now somebody block jumps up to block the shot or get the rebound after every the play is already done. It doesn't make any sense. So it, that's just one of those context uh, dependent things. You know, like increasing peak power is good, but increasing peak power when it's not usable is bad. Well, I'm not going to say bad, but it's not necessarily the smartest thing in the world. You know, uh, the goal is to keep the goal the goal, and let's not waste time. Uh, at least from my standpoint, uh, looking at that. So I, I really like looking at it from that standpoint, the time to peak power and the loads at which peak power occur. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because those are two super low-hanging fruits. Those are really, really easy to change. It's like, how do you change it? If they're hitting peak power at too heavy of a load or too, uh, or it's taking too long, give them light weights and make them jump, right? And do drop jumps, not depth or anything like that. I'm sure they're not ready for it because that takes like six or eight months to prepare for. Uh, and if they, guess what, if they're weaker than a kitten, well, that'll pop up on their relative force at minimum displacement or force at zero velocity, depending on what your uh, system you're using and what country you're in. Uh, if that's low, then just get them stronger. You know, it's, the, the, I think that we, really could take it back to just a few variables and make training super simple and uh, I think there's going to be better results because I know that every time that I have tried to um, science the shit out of the program and make it like the most coolest program because I'm bored and those are always the ones that get the least results so you know I think that we need to just go simple look for the big rocks the low-hanging fruit fix those and uh, you know and then just doing that, that probably takes up three or four years of training. And then uh, at the end of those three or four years, it's like, what do you do next? It's a good question. I don't know, because by then they are off into pro sport or they've graduated. Uh, so, you know, I'm real good at knowing what that four to five and now with COVID, maybe six years of training should look like. After that, uh, you know, it, it's no man's land for me. I've got my thoughts, but I, you know, I, I, uh, I don't have the practical experience to really, you know, feel confident about saying it. Right. And so, if someone doesn't actually have that type of equipment, uh, where they can actually measure where peak power is occurring, um, are there any sort of, let's say, subjective metrics or, or proxies that you might use for just an average person in the gym who's 
they're they're competitive, they're a serious lifter, but uh, and they're wanting to kind of take advantage of these things. They don't have a phone. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm not I'm not super tech savvy, so I, I don't know about some of these apps maybe that are out. Yeah, well, so like uh, I believe it's Carlos Balsabore has that My Lifts app, right, or My Jumps okay. app, and you could create a force velocity profile using that. So it's ten bucks. You don't need the fancy equipment. So you create that force velocity profile, compare it against the athletes that are out there, uh, or look for your location of peak power and use that. You know, it, it's not that you have to have uh, the most famous, you know, the greatest machines out there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah, right here. On my, I'm, I know I'm fortunate, right? On my desk is a Gymware power tool. Now, this is a really old one. This is, uh, it's so old that they've, this is back when they would write the unit number the model number or whatever it is in pencil, now pen, right? Because uh, they were still a small company at that point in time. But I know that I'm fortunate. But you don't have to have the coolest tools mm -hmm. to go be able to do the stuff. If you know math, you're going to be doing pretty good. Okay. So, uh, and we've got our phone apps. You know, these things can the what is it? 240 hertz, uh, 240 frames per second, is what the camera will record in slow motion. So you can do a tremendous amount with that, uh, especially all you've got to do is have it calibrated to some sort of reference. And then what is velocity? It's just distance divided by time. And if you know the start point, you know the end point, you know how many frames it took, you got, you got it right there. You got the velocity of the barbell. So it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to use the research grade tools. That camera app will be fine, especially if it's a one person thing and you use it for three, four times a year. There's no sense spending 20, I don't know how much the gym wears are now, uh, or, you know, uh, a number of other units. The camera app will be fine. If you want right. to use training, though, I would recommend getting something, you know, mm -hmm. whether it be, uh, you know, again, gym wear is my favorite because they're the most accurate. Uh, you know, we're currently doing a study on it, and it goes gym wear, and interestingly enough, uh, I'll, I'll share it whenever it comes public with all the numbers, but uh, the number two uh, unit, well, I actually think it's number three, was the, uh, the Flex, their little uh, reflective unit uh, using laser and light. It's remarkably accurate for its cost, and hmm. um, in, in that you're looking at four or five hundred bucks. Are you getting, you know, versus the the twenty five hundred or three thousand dollars from the Power Tool or the RS? Like, dude, that that's good enough for most people. You know, that's wild. small it fits in the bag the downside of it is you've got to have i call it a yoga mat uh they might not like me saying that but you know that's that's what it looks like to me but you have to use that because it's light based it's got to reflect the light uh you know the downside to it is having light based well if your the unit starts moving too far away from the mat so maybe i'm doing an overhead press snatch jerk uh then it kind of loses some, it, it did in the model that i had uh lose some of its efficacy uh, because it's just the light interference. It, uh, it, it, it blocks it. So what I found for the overhead press and the jerks, though, is if you just set up jerk blocks and you put them out on the jerk block, it works just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but the snatch, at least for that, uh, with the way that I was doing it, it, it didn't, uh, for tall people, it didn't work. For me, I'm an Oompa Loompa, it was fine. But for, uh, for the, you know, the six foot four and above people, it, it, it was having some, some issues. Like there right. was a lot of there were some missed reps and some of the velocities were off. No, that totally makes sense. Awesome. No, thanks for thanks for sharing that stuff. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the things that I wanted to get on as well is uh, training on unstable surfaces versus training with unstable loads. So, um, I think a lot you of have the times deep dives. things yeah. are. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think a lot of the times when people talk about unstable training they don't necessarily differentiate between those two things. And I've always seen like a huge orthopedic benefit from doing some of that other stuff. So it's like, I'll, I guess I'll kind of classify it the way that I usually will frame the, the conversation around some of these activities is like, they're more so, it's not that they directly enhance your performance, it's that they do things that allow the activities that enhance your performance to be pushed at a very high output, right, yeah. while remaining relatively injury free. And so I was wondering if you could kind of differentiate between uh, unstable surfaces versus unstable loads 
and then also just talking about potential implementation for strength athletes, whether it be powerlifters uh, or, or strongmen. Those are probably the biggest cohorts that uh, that listen to the podcast. Okay. Yeah. So unstable surfaces. What the unstable surface does is it does increase the chaos of the movement and increase movement variability, which is a good thing. However, one of the ways that it does it, and the reason why it's so great for rehabilitation, is that it causes it to occur at a slow pace, right? So then uh, if, if you're just relearning how to walk, let's say that somebody had a stroke or uh, uh, some other sort of traumatic brain injury and they're having to relearn how to walk, well, it, it, every step that they're taking, there's a lot of shaking and movement that's going on and we need to slow down some of that reaction type thing. Well, it needs to be introduced to make sure that the muscles turn on. It needs to be slowed down. Well, those unstable surfaces usually do that really, really well. You know, the AirX pad, the uh, the Dyna discs and things like that, they cause that increase in movement and they also slow it down to where the, the joint and the musculature can catch back up, relearn how to use their proprioceptors and then go on. Now, most of the people aren't using TBI. I was just trying to use that uh, as a uh, example, I'm sure that everybody has seen like stroke rehab, or, you know, or videos of it online and, and, and watching the people. So I was just trying to recreate that, that memory. It's not, I'm not saying stroke patients would be using this. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. That's not my, that's not my wheelhouse. But it does slow everything down so that the body can relearn how to use those proprioceptors. And it has that great movement variability, you know, and it, so that makes it harder. So a lot of people like that. However, that decrease, I'm sorry, that increase in time, uh, that's not a good thing because that teaches the muscles that they can wait a little while to turn back on. Now, if you have 67 milliseconds for a, a ligament to rupture and it takes 87 milliseconds for that muscle to contract, we're already in a 20 millisecond, dip, and maybe it's microsecond. I don't remember right now off the top of my head. I should have looked that up, but I didn't know we were talking about it, so I, that's okay. If, uh, if I'm off on the numbers, guys, I apologize. I, I don't really care, though. Um, but uh, so we know that there's a deficit that's going to exist between the contraction time and the tear. Why then would we want to increase that? The unstable load. It the well. Let's actually. You know what? Let let me ask this a little bit different way. Hey, Daniel, have you ever been to a? Uh, have you ever been to a basketball game? Yes. Okay. How many times have you seen people moving in the basketball game? Hundred <laughs> percent. How many times have you seen the floor move in a basketball game? Zero percent. Okay, now some of the other sports will be, you know, if we talk about football and volleyball, they'll talk about, oh, well, the grass sometimes, blah, blah, blah. Get, get out of here, man. We're talking about like a .001% occurrence. Uh, that, it, it doesn't happen that often. Uh, but my point is, is that the stable is surface. Uh, I'm sorry, the surface is stable. The environment is chaotic. Now, if we go with unstable loads, as far as a sport uh, spec, uh, standpoint, point of view, uh, perspective, we know that if we can recreate that unstable environment on a stable surface, that's more of what sport really is. Uh, the contraction times happen more quickly in, in, in other. Now, uh, for somebody who is a strength athlete, they're like, okay, well, that's well and great, but that doesn't really relate to me. Well, not yet, yeah, it does, actually. So if we look at some of the, there's a few studies that Mike Lawrence was involved with. He's up at the University of New England. Uh, he's a really good power lifter, uh, and uh, he's getting to be a good researcher up there as well. One of the things that he did was he looked at the unstable loads uh, with the kettlebell and the bamboo bar, earthquake bar, whatever that it's currently trademarked as. And uh, what they found was you would get the exact same muscle activation at two thirds of the load with the unstable loads, right? So if you're normally benching 500 pounds for your sets, well, two thirds of that would be, well, let's see, 340 pounds. Well, that's putting a lot less torque on the joint while the muscle is still getting the same work. So it's a great way to continue to work the muscle without damaging the body. Uh, I really like these for, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, 
Uh, one of my old training partners and I, Dave Beversdorf, uh, he swears that this extended his career by a few years, uh, where we would go a dynamic effort day, a max effort day, and then a chaos day. He just called it a wobbly day. Uh, and that we were able to maintain training at high intensities, high loads, uh, but without putting quite as much wear, you know, wear and tear on the, the tires. Because uh, we were both, up, shoot, he was in his 40s, I was in my 30s at that standpoint. Uh, at that time point so we you know we're just getting what we could but i really feel like uh louis was right on that man you know the better that we got at it the better the more our bench went up you know that because it works all the stabilizer muscles in addition to the prime movers now me bringing that up the uh, stabilizing musculature with the suspended kettlebells and the earthquake bar there were times when it, the stabilizer musculature would be nearly double the activity of it was under the straight bar condition so then that, to me, that's huge because what is it that prevents the injury? Well, it's those small muscles, those, pro, you know, those proprioceptive muscles. It's not the big, uh, the, the big rock, the, the main mover muscles. It's not the pec major and the triceps. You know, it's those little tiny muscles that are stabilizing the shoulder, stabilizing the scapula, stabilizing the shoulder and elbow. I mean, holy cow, the biceps activation on uh, the bench press and the unstable load was tremendous and a lot of people don't uh, whenever they look at that they thought it was um, just an error and I, I, I heard people whenever I presented this in class one time like oh it's just an error it's a random error I'm like random error what do you mean You're like well the biceps flex the elbow how do they stabilize the shoulder it's like dude let's go back to anatomy where's the origin of the biceps brachii oh the coracoid process hmm, where's the coracoid process on it's your freaking scapula Okay, great. Where's the long head origin? Oh, the superglenoid tubercle. Did you just say glenoid? Oh, like glenoid fossa? Like the thing that's the scapula where the, the head of the humerus sits into? Yeah, the bicep is a major shoulder stabilizer. And I think that the moving away from the training of the biceps is what caused an increase in the slap tears over the past 20 years in strength and conditioning. So, you know, that there's no muscle that we've got that is has no purpose. Uh, if you want to talk about a divine creator or evolution, either way, we don't have a lot of crap that's useless. You know, some people will argue for the appendix, but I mean, yeah, you can live without an appendix, but it's better to have one. Um, you know, so uh, sorry for that soapbox. I'm feeling like Buddy Morris lately. Anytime anybody asks me a question, 20 minutes later, I finish the answer. No, honestly. <clears throat> oh, I got a frog in my throat. Uh, I, I love the tangents. Um, they're, they're always so interesting, so I, I definitely appreciate that. But that's definitely something I've um, had to have a couple conversations about: is like muscle action versus muscle function, and then relative to position in space. Because yeah. it's like, you know, oh, your pec is an internal rotator or whatever. Like when when people will say that, and it's like, yeah, kind of. But then, what if your arm is back here? Well, now your pec is an external rotator. You know what I mean? So, like, I'm not sure if you can see. If you're like this... No, I can see your position. arm, but I'm just not seeing how that could externally rotate. The pec could actually externally rotate the arm because your pec would have to rip off and flip around to the other side for external rotation to occur. Right. It's, so, still, so, inter it's still pulling it down, and it's still moving in. It's still rotating in. I don't get this. Right, right, right. So, sorry. What I'm saying, though, is that it's, like, the activation of the pec. If I'm flexing my pec, it's going to pull my arm slightly forward. Like, it's going to assist in, in external rotation. It's not going to oh, directly you're saying flexion. externally rotate it. Um, but it's going to pull it, sorry, yes, All right, so th th there's a handful of things there, right, but like, um, the function kind of can change at times, depending on like, your position. Oh, position, space, yeah, right? no, absolutely, yeah, the, I think a better example of that would be the pectineus, right, where mm -hmm. uh, below 90 degrees, it is an adductor, but once you get above, uh, once you get above 90 degrees, it actually works as a flexor of the hip. Right, so then you're even going through the same uh, same normal motion of flexion. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. All of a sudden, it turns on as a uh, as a flexor. I get what you're saying. Now, um, I'm not I'm not a I great anatomy that, guy. I'll yeah, be honest. yeah. That the actions the actions threw me off. Where the pec, you know, it was working as a shoulder <clears throat> flexor at that point. I, I I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so. Uh, sorry, I just kind of lost my train of thought for a moment. No worries. Um, no worries. So, in terms of tactics and, and principles, um, 
I'm a big fan of trying to think of things from like a first principle standpoint. Do you know who Pat Davidson is? I, I know Pat. I haven't looked at his stuff in a little while, but I, I, okay. yeah, I met him. Met him. God, it's been about probably eight years ago now. Yes, yeah, so I'm. I'm a huge fan of anyone essentially who is like this is kind of the concept, and it just gives like such a broad application to different things. So I really yeah. like a lot of his work. I like a lot of your work for that exact reason because there's like this broad understanding of the the kind of theory and then you can kind of apply it however creatively you want um and i've sort of noticed that the more that i venture into more i guess traditional snc or just sports outside of just strength sports there's so much stuff that um that i think we have to learn from from other disciplines oh, yeah. and i was wondering just because you have a really unique background you do a lot of snc but you're also you know, very strong powerlifting coach yourself or powerlifter yourself. And I think that blend is, is really interesting in terms of what you're actually exposed to from an athlete standpoint from, from various developmental strategies. And so I was wondering if there were any sort of tactics or principles or anything like that that you think are maybe undervalued or underexplored uh, in the strength sports world. You know, I think one of them, the most underutilized is probably more of a, a good self-examination. Um, you know, in, I guess I could, yeah, let me try and, I, I'm, let me take a little different tact on this. Uh, because I think I might be able to illustrate it. it maybe, maybe I misunderstood the question, but this, this might, you know, kind of, kind of go into it. That we're, we're going to have biases based upon where we come from, right? You know, uh, and it, it doesn't matter what area we're talking about. You know, it, it could even be as simple as language. I mean, you go down to like uh, Oklahoma and Texas, instead of tomato, they say mater. Uh, and uh, you go over to England and they're saying tomato. Uh, you know, that it, it's the same language, but you know, there's the different pronunciations. Well, we're always gonna have these biases. As a, as a strength and condition, you know, strength athlete that went into strength and conditioning, I ended up having a lot of biases that I wasn't aware of, right? Because Everything about powerlifting is getting a biggest squat, bench, and deadlift. So, of course, you're going to think that pushing squat, bench, and deadlift is going to be the best thing for everyone. And whenever we went to the College World Series, it, whenever I was at Missouri State, Southwest Missouri, when we were, uh, did that back in 2003, 20 years ago now, uh, which no wonder I got so much freaking gray in my beard, um, was uh, that all those guys were super strong. You know, we had tons of guys hitting bombs. They were just a bunch of big, strong dudes. Ryan Howard was a big, strong dude. <clears throat> Max Scherzer, whenever I was out in Missouri, he was a big, strong dude. You know, also then for baseball players, you got to be big and strong. And so that just, you know, it was confirmation bias. Just keep going, going down that road. And then whenever I got here at Miami and we did force, a full force velocity profile, not the traditional load velocity that I was used to doing, I saw that the where differentiation between uh, success, I guess you would say, or talent, was at the velocity end of the spectrum, at the unloaded stuff, and not the, the strength end of the spectrum at all. Those guys didn't vary down there. Their characteristics varied at the velocity end of the spectrum. So I think that what we have to do is start to recognize what our own biases are and then work to combat that because that held my athletes back for 15 years, at least 15 years. Well, more than 15, you know, it was starting to 98 to about 2018, it was 20 years that, you know, I had this confirmation bias. And whenever I got away from it, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, and it allowed me to think about stuff from another perspective. Because if you're lifting, if everything is about the heavy load, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be strong. Don't, don't get me wrong there. Don't get it twisted. I still think people should be able to squat around a double body weight uh, to be a, uh, because that's where you're going to be uh, highest resilience as well as, you know, really good uh, performance levels uh, as a result of that. Uh, but what I found was, and I stopped and I stepped back and I thought, it's like, well, what, is, what do we really need high levels of strength outside of resilience? And it's, you know, for performance and how. Okay, well, we're going to need to be able to overcome external loads. Fantastic. What's the external load that you have to overcome in baseball? A baseball and a bat. How heavy is a baseball? About five ounces. How heavy is a bat? 32 ounces. And somebody's going to come up, well, with the rotary torque due to the length of the bat, you need to, whatever. It's still light. 
Okay. So you've got just over, you know, light external loads that you're overcoming. You're not overcoming your opponents. You're not overcoming, uh, you know, some heavy ass load. So at the, the velocity and the spectrum is where it needs to work. So what I really encourage people to do is start looking at things from the performance and injury lens and see what enhances performance and decreases injury risk. If you're working in programs, you can just start out with a simple correlation analysis. And you can do, you know, if uh, you, all you've got is Excel, well, there's a statistical package for Excel. Honestly, I haven't used it because I've got SPSS uh, and, and some other tools. Uh, but, you know, there's also things like JASP and Jamobi that are like SPSS, but they're free. Um, just to run simple correlation analyses, man, and start to see what happened. Where's the relationships? You also have to apply some context because, you know, uh, correlation is pretty weak. Um, you know, and it's easy to kind of fool things. You know, there was a, uh, there's like a 20 year span, 30 year span that the uh, Super Bowl winner was a, was highly correlated with if it's going to be a bull, I think it was actually a perfect correlation for like 20 years, the perfect correlation with the bull and bear uh, market for the stock market. Well, what emphasis, what, what, who, if, if somebody's an AFC or NFC, what does that have to do with the stock market? Not a damn thing. So you have to apply some context there. Uh, and it's like, what do you mean? Well, you know, if it says that, um, oh gosh, let me try and think of something. If our, just some random mass metric that's calculated was related to injury. And then whenever we stop and we think, it's like, well, this thing doesn't do anything that would be a predictive injury. It's not actually giving us a force. It's not giving us a power. It's not giving us a rate. It's not giving us asymmetry. You know, it's like saying athletes that uh, athletes that have a longer flight time are more likely to be injured. Okay, well, that's saying the athletes who jump the highest are more likely to be injured. Well, why? Well, it's probably because they're putting out the most force, the most power, and they're probably the ones on the field getting the most playing time. So it's not the jump height itself that has to deal more with playing ability. So, and if you just chase jump height, well, then you're like, oh, okay, well, if they go over 40 inches, I, then, you know, they're going to get hurt. Okay. Uh, so the people who play more get hurt. It, it, it's that simple. That's what it is at the end of the day. So then you're chasing a red herring. You know, that red herring is something that's there that appears to be a clue, appears to be a solution, but it's not. It's just something random or something that was placed by somebody else, but you're not going to have somebody else play, you know, jack you up like that. Uh, was that kind of the question that you were going after there, Daniel? Uh, or did I just yeah, completely no. misunderstand it? <clears throat> no, no, not at all. I think that was a, a really insightful answer. So um, that definitely happens in, in powerlifting for sure. Like, <clears throat> I'm not sure what's going on in my throat today. Uh, but, yeah, so, I mean, for instance, a great example is, should I do this squat or that squat? Which one's yeah. better? You're like, I don't know. Like, I don't know how you squat. I don't know what your deficits are. I don't know where you're at in your competitive cycle. I don't know what your technical ability is. I don't know anything, right? So yeah, it, it's like, and even even the right, ex like, quote unquote, the right exercise, if done incorrectly, isn't necessarily going to produce the desired outcome. So there's oh, yeah. like, it's, I, I definitely see where you're coming from in that. And that, that's, uh, that, that critical analysis and that, I guess, ongoing analysis as well is, is pretty, takes a lot of effort, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I think that's the big thing why people just don't do it as much is because you actually just literally have to sit down every week and like review, how did my training week go? What happened differently this week? How was my sleep? How was my this? Like, and like you said, make sure you're factoring in all, all the covariates or potential other outside influences that are going to skew the outcomes and, and making decisions a little bit less emotionally, I guess we can say. You just reminded me of one of my favorite quotes, quotes of all time, Daniel, and it was from uh, Thomas Edison. He said, most people don't find success because it's dressed in overalls and looks like hard work. So that, yeah. uh, you know, that, that you, you're talking about that, it's like, oh, it's a lot of work. Yeah, and that's why a lot of people aren't successful. It's really easy to follow a cookie cutter program, but it's not going to produce the results. It's not going to make champions of people that weren't going to be champions anyway. You know, Randy, uh, yeah, Randy yeah. Moss is always going to be Randy Moss. You know, it didn't matter what you did with him in the weight room. Allen Iverson, same thing. I mean, there's freaking proof. There was only one strength coach in, the, uh, in all of the NBA that could get Allen Iverson to lift weights. And 
Allen Iverson's still one of the all-time greats. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we've always got to have context. Yeah, no, I agree. It, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of an interesting philosophical discussion, I guess, once you kind of get into some of that stuff. Um, so in terms of projects or anything that you're working on right now, I always like to ask people what, I guess, what they're interested in pursuing at the moment. Like if there's any sort of topic or subject or new thing that you're working on where you're like, this is really interesting to me for A, B, and C reasons. You know, uh, there's, God, there, you know, what am I not working on right now? My, uh, my wife is pissed because I'm, uh, pulled myself into so many di different directions again. Uh, we're doing some markerless motion analysis stuff that, uh, you know, that some people at Stanford made this thing called open cap and, uh, oh, okay. it allows you to sync iPhones and, or iPads with a Mac and do markerless motion capture. That's within, uh, on the movements that we did. I, this is from the bioengineer. Uh, I think it was within two degrees of Vicon, right? And Vicon is the is the gold standard, right? So, and Vicon costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars. This costs uh, however much three iPhones cost you. Two iPhones actually. We're using three because of the uh, the stuff that's going on in the project that we're doing. Uh, we're doing it specifically on soccer specific activities. We needed three to be able to get the uh, the size up, but you know you could do it with two. Um, and we're looking at that for injury and for performance. Uh, some uh, doing tons of stuff with the counter movement jump, looking at differences between sports, differences in performance, and differences. Uh, are there injury predictors that are different by sport? Are there key performance indicators that are different by sport? What's happening with the monitoring? You know, are the sport specific activities following the jumps? They don't always. Uh, uh, the with those key performance indicators, you know, we're even finding some different ones and implementing those with sport. You know, um, uh, what else? Uh, where peak power occurs, the force velocity profiling, how athletes vary based upon their, you know, do athletes have, does everybody adapt the same or do you adapt differently based on how you produce force and velocity? And you know, newsflash, that's already been done. It, it, it does, but it just uh, you know, why why then are we redoing it? Because you, you basically have to to make sure, you know. Um, it was always like, oh, why do people keep re replicating the same studies? Well, because you you know, I've had well, I can explain it this way: the standing long jump article uh, that came out, uh, the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, where we developed an equation for standing long jump, works amazing with football players. It's really accurate with football players. We had female athletes, not student athletes, I'm sorry, female students, not student athletes, just uh, the regular students in, in labs trying to do that, the test and calculate their power, and then all of a sudden they're getting negative powers. It's like, how do you have a negative power? You don't. It's that the equation didn't work for them uh, because of you know, population specificity, and you don't find that out without replication of the process. Mm -hmm. So you know, you, you've got to just continually go back and do that. Uh, you know, so that's that's that on a research standpoint. Uh, educationally, I'm trying to get out a couple of things on uh, plyometrics. Uh, myself and Antonio Squiante are, are going to be teaming up on that, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, I, I have a, a, an expansion of my deeper than the data stuff because I've done a lot of equate, you know, development of a lot of different equations since then as other people have, that just kind of shows that, hey, if you're already, if I'm collecting these five variables, right, maybe I'm collecting uh, some sort of conditioning test, a couple of strength numbers, a body composition, and a couple of jumps, right? What else can I do with it? And calculations to give deeper information. Uh, you know, sprint momentum. Uh, for sprint force, sprint power, sprint velocity uh, you, that you could get you from just knowing the time that somebody had on their sprint. Well, and if I can calculate sprint force, that's, eh, maybe, maybe not uh, because of uh, other confounding variables like drag and friction and things. Uh, and I can, then I've got the velocity. Well, force times velocity is power and mass times velocity is momentum. And, you know, so just being able to go out from there and just teach people that, hey, this is what we can do. Uh, you know, that just because you only collect these five things, it doesn't mean that they're five independent things and you never have to look at anything else. Well, let's look at their interactions mm -hmm. and let's see what happens based upon that. Uh, so I've got a couple education projects that I'm working on because I really, you know, my whole thing is I want to be able to, 
my goal in life is to wherever I am is that if I leave, we always will leave this world, right? I'm not just saying leaving, you know, if I leave a job. I want to make sure that the place is better than I found it. And so, you know, doing the education side of it, doing the research, that's uh, that that's how I'm trying to give back and, and push the field forward for the, you know, for everybody forever. Um, not just have this status quo maintained. I want to leave it a better place than I got it. Uh, am I always right? Nope, not always right. Uh, nobody is. I'm wrong every day all the time. You can ask my wife. Uh, she'll tell you how wrong I was this morning, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, that that's just it, is I want to try and push things and make sure that we're doing uh, that, that uh, if nothing else, I made somebody think. And that's what I'm hoping for. Awesome, man. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because I'm reading a... a book the singularity is near by Ray Ray Kurzweil and you know just you talking about technology and the rate of advancement and going from a two hundred fifty thousand dollar you know unit to I mean what like a thousand dollars yes probably it's pretty pretty insane and, uh, yeah. and I mean the rate of exponential growth of technology is ridiculous and then the exponent itself is actually increasing in an exponential fashion as well and so it's like just the stuff that we're going to have in like 10 years 20 years 30 years is is pretty wild so um Dude, yeah yeah that's that's insane well we're coming up on that hour mark and uh just wanted to say thank you so much for for jumping on it's been an absolute pleasure to to chat with you and i uh, definitely learned a couple new things made some notes to to look into a couple things so i appreciate that where can yeah, people well, find you um, easy to find because um, I'm not very original. Uh, J. Brian Mann, uh, it, you know, on all the social media spots, you know, that's, uh, I say all of them, all that I'm on. I think I'm on, like, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, I don't really get on Snapchat. I got TikTok, but I just look at music videos on there, man. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, not, not trying to do anything there. Uh, you know, if they're here at, at Miami, you know, my I'm easy to find between Max Orvitz and the Hecht building. Um yeah so i'm just the only thing that's hard for me is email because i get too many of them uh so it's always easiest to re you know like you did you reached out to me on social media if you would have emailed me right off the bat i never would have seen it uh I i'm really busy but i'm not that uh, i'm not that cool you know i think i, I might get a, a tweet a day uh but i'll have 300 emails mm -hmm. so yeah no, i definitely get how that is <laughs> yeah awesome man well all that stuff's going to be linked up in the show notes. Definitely go make sure you check out some of the stuff he's doing. He's been putting out amazing content for a long time. Like I said at the beginning, I was kind of binging on a, a ton of his articles, uh, even just prior to this, to, to prep for the podcast. And it was really, really awesome to, to refresh on a lot of the content that he's put out. So I'd highly recommend checking it out. He's written for Elite FTS a freaking ton. Just put out a ton of content on a regular basis. So it was really awesome. My pleasure. <laughs>